Thank you for that song. Go, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32 this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 32, and then uh, turn over to Romans chapter 10. Also, we're going to read. I'm going to read two passages to you this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're going to start reading in verse 15. And it says, "But Jeshurun, which is a name God would call Israel, he's talking about the children of Israel here." And it says, "But Jeshurun is waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxed and fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness." Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. Provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to gods, to gods whom they knew not. To new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a froward generation, children in whom is no faith. I want you to notice that that right there is the first time we see the word faith mentioned in the Bible. And Jesus, our God said, that these were children in whom was no faith. They have moved me to jealousy uh, with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Okay, and that's talking about the Gentiles. That's talking about us. And that Romans ten nineteen proves that. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But he says, for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. That's the first time we see the term hell or the word hell mentioned in all the Bible and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So right here we see that God, he's mad at Jerusalem or he's mad at Israel because they were disobedient and their problem was they were children that had no faith. And God was angry at them for that. And I mean, an anger burned. He said it burns into the lowest hell. And then turn over to Romans chapter 10, and verse 13. And God said, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with a foolish nation. And it says in verse, uh, Romans 10, 13, you all know this. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation. I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So what we see here in the Bible is in, in the Old Testament, you only see the word faith used two times. But then when you get into the New Testament, you see it used over 200 times. And we see, though, in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that because Israel would not listen to God, because they would not believe him, because they would not have faith, God said, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with, an, with another nation. And I don't have time to go to all the scriptures that teach us, but Jesus talked about it, about how they were going to come from the north and the south and the east and the west. And they were going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom, but the children of the kingdom were going to be thrust out. Jesus said that after a Gentile came and showed great faith. Jesus could not find that kind of faith in Israel, but he was finding faith among the Gentiles. And because of that, God, we see he went to the Gentiles and saved the Gentiles while the Jews ended up losing the kingdom and it ended up going to those who are of faith, which is people like you and me. And so we see, though, in the, in the Bible, and there's so many scriptures we could go to on this, but we see throughout the, in the New Testament, faith, it's mentioned over and over again. We're saved by grace through faith. We're saved by faith without works. Over and over again, we see that theme and so, but, you know, why did Jesus make such a big deal about faith? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Now, we all know that we're saved by grace through faith. But why faith? 
you know, why not works? I mean, doesn't works make more sense? Doesn't it make more sense that a person would go to heaven because they were good? Or at least, does it make sense that a person would go to heaven because they at least tried to be good? Okay, but what's interesting about that, you know, we have Israel who was kind of trying, and you have the Gentiles who the Bible said they weren't looking for righteousness. But the Bible says they found it. And the Jews who followed after righteousness, they have not obtained righteousness. You know why? Because they tried to find it by the works of the law and not by faith. And they missed it. And you and I, we found it. But what, what is the big deal about faith? Turn, and turn over to Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. You know, I was thinking about that. You know, everybody wants to make it about works one way or the other. But it's clear in the Bible that it is. It's about faith. But look, what is the big deal about faith? Why is that so important to God? Shouldn't there be some expectation from us? Shouldn't there be some requirements, some works that he places on us? But it says in uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, And when Jesus was entering into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And that was the verse I was referring to when Jesus said, you know, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Jesus was amazed at the faith of this man. You remember when the, you know, the Jews would often laugh at him. Remember when he was going to go he, raise that one girl from the dead? And the Jews, they laughed him to scorn. But here you have a centurion, a Gentile, that's like, I know you can do this. In fact, you can just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus, man, he was, he was blown away by that. And he, he looked at that man as a great example of faith. Why did he care so much about it? Why was it such a big deal? And I'm here today to tell you why faith is so important. And I believe, I believe this is important. And listen, I, you know, I thank God we're independent Baptists. I thank God we're not a part of a denomination. But listen, independent Baptists are going downhill real fast. And it breaks my heart. And I am disturbed greatly at what I am seeing coming from Baptist churches and what is being taught in churches. And I, I, plan, I was gone all week. I planned this message at the beginning of the week. But I, I can't even tell you all the experiences I had this week. Even when I was just out soul winning, that was like, man, I'm glad I'm preaching on this this Sunday because I need to get some of this stuff off my chest. And one of the things I saw, my wife, she, uh, she follows this uh, on Twitter. Those of you who are familiar with Twitter, uh, an account called Theology Without Apology. And Theology Without Apology, they did a tweet. And if you don't know what a tweet is, I, I don't have time to catch up on you know, modern lingo. But they did a tweet saying, telling people to repent of their sins in order to be saved leads to work salvation and pharisaicalism. And you know what? The only thing I slightly disagree with in that statement is they said it leads to. I say it is. I have, and I do, I agree with them. I'm glad they said that's a great tweet, right? Well, you wouldn't believe the response that they got. And I don't know who these people are. I, mean, I think some of them are pastors. But listen to the response they get from a bunch of so called Baptists. Matt Cook, he said, I've been on your side up until now. Acts 2.38 says, repent for the remission of sins. It's not a work, it's a commandment to do right. Well, listen, Matt Cook, Acts 2.38 says, repent for the remission of sins. But what does repent mean? You see, people today, they've changed the definition of repent. Now, they know most of the time you see the word repent in the Bible, it's God repenting. But they somehow have attached a definition saying to repent means to repent of your sins, even though that statement is nowhere in the Bible. Okay, you come show me where it says repent of your sins in the Bible, all right? It's not there. You will not see that phrase, yet it's repeated over and over again. But it always says, it often says, you know, it repented the Lord that he made man. What was it saying? God had changed his mind. And what do we teach that a person needs to do to get saved is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We have to trust in him. We've got to change our minds about following after works for salvation, which is what most people are doing, and say, you know what? It's not about my works. I, I've changed my mind. I believe in Him. That's what repentance is. It's a change of mind. And there are no works involved. But somehow Matt Cook doesn't know that. Sammy K. Jr. said, he's speaking to the Jews there about the kingdom 
not a Gentile there unless a proselyte. Don't mix kingdom message and grace. Now, you might not know where he's going with that, but there is a teaching out there that there are multiple gospels, that Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom and Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God, and they are different gospels. You know what? The Bible says if anybody teach that, let him be accursed. And you know what, Sammy K., you can be accursed. That is wicked. Jesus taught the same gospel that Paul taught. It, it, you, there is not a different gospel for the Jews and for the Gentiles. There is no difference between Jew nor Greek. I, I can't believe this, folks. This is getting out of control. I mean, this stuff, this, you know, this dispensational salvation teaching, I mean, it has plagued churches like leprosy. And it is, it's destroying churches. It makes me sick. This repent of your sins thing. It has infiltrated Baptist churches and, and people are just repeating this over and over again. And this is a big deal. This is a salvation issue. Hey, this is not something that, you know, there are some things we can disagree on. And the theology without apology, people, I don't even know who they are. I don't know any of these people personally. They probably wouldn't like a lot of what I teach. But you know what? They are right on this issue. And I hope they stick to their guns. They, because they're, you know, they're, you know, they got more of these people tweeting out. Matthew Lyon said Peter was not preaching, uh, preaching gospel after the resurrection of Jesus. And you think that's stupid. Well, listen, according to dispensationalism, you know, the gospel didn't get start getting preached until like Acts 8 or 9. I mean, once again, that's just pure stupidity right there. Jeff Douglas, Jesus commanded the apostles to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So you're contradicting Jesus. I mean, uh, this is ridiculous. You know, William Hemsworth, how dare Jesus tell us to repent? Matthew 4, 17. Because Jesus said... For that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, Jesus told us to repent, but what does repent mean? It's a change of mind. And who's he telling to repent? He is telling a bunch of Jews to repent. Well, what were the Jews trying to do to get to heaven? They were trying to repent of their sins. You know, they were trying to do the works. They thought they were good. And Jesus said, no, you're all you're sinners. We've all sinned and y'all need to stop trusting in your works and you need to believe me. You need to believe my words. You need to accept the free gift of salvation by faith. That's what you need to do. And we got a lot of people today, they're already, they're already going after good works. They're walking after good works, trying to think if I'm good enough, I'm going to get to heaven and no, they need to repent of that. And they need to say, no, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm done going after good works and I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust his word. I'm going to believe. His word. I'm going to accept the free gift of salvation. But these people that teach you have to repent of their sins, okay, I agree repentance is a, it's a 180, going another direction. But do you understand? Most people are already going after good works. And for you to say repent of your sins, you're basically saying just run faster in the wrong direction. That doesn't work. That is not what repentance is. Ducky D13 says, dumbest thing I've read today. That's the dumbest person I've ever heard of right there. You know, Robert Wilson, repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now, Baptists are known for this, just taking one verse out of context and making it mean whatever they mean. And if you take that story, it, it, it's not talking about salvation right there. Okay, We should repent of our sins. Okay, If you're sinning, you should stop sinning and quit doing that. You should repent of your sins, but nowhere in the Bible does it teach you to repent of your sins for salvation. And it was not telling him to do that so he would go to heaven. It's because what he was doing was wicked. It was wrong and he needed to repent of it. And if you're sinning, you need to repent of your sins, but that is not what saves because it is a work. And so this guy just, I mean, classic taken out of context, uh, you know, and then uh, KT at K KT in Hills says, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Once again, he just doesn't know what repentance means. And then thankfully, finally we get a breath of fresh air. Finally, one person comes along, you know, Pastor Tim DeLello, and he says, repentance from dead works, not sins. And he references Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. That's what it means to repent. It's for repenting from dead works. In other words, these people thought that they were going to heaven because of their works of the law. And the Bible said they're dead works. And you need to repent of that and you need to have faith. That is what repentance is. Thankfully, somebody's got a brain. Thankfully, somebody's at least got the gospel right. And listen, theology without apology was right. 
And I hope they stick to their guns because I'm sick of these Baptist popes teaching this false doctrine and shoving it down people's throats and the political pressure. It is on to teach that you're supposed to repent of your sins to get saved. And it's a bunch of garbage. It's work salvation. It is not what the Bible teaches. It is about faith in Christ. And what's the big deal about that? I, you know, I kind of wish it was repent of your sins. Cause you know what? I get kind of aggravated about what God's people do sometimes. And I wish I could tell you all you're going to hell if you do those things and you're not really saved. Maybe I could get better results out of you. But you know what? I'd be lying to you if I said that. I'm not allowed to put more on you than God put on you. That is just not what the Bible teaches. So while it's not convenient, I am required to preach what the Bible actually teaches. And listen, it is very clear. Salvation has always been about faith. We don't have time to read it, but just read Hebrews chapter 11 when it goes through all the way from Abel, you know, all throughout the Old Testament through the so-called dispensations. And it shows it was always about faith. It was always by faith. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham got saved before he offered up Isaac or attempted to offer up Isaac. He was already saved before he did that work. Abraham was saved without works. If Abraham had been justified by works, he hath where of the glory is what the Bible says. Abraham was not justified by works. But so why did God choose faith? Why is that a big deal? Because this is important. And obviously a lot of Baptists do not understand why God chose faith and why faith is so important. They all use it. They'll say the word. They'll say, you know, we're saved by grace through faith. But then they'll still teach repent of your sins to be saved. But why, why is faith? Well, first, God chose faith because we're incapable of works. Turn over to Romans chapter 3. See, this is the problem today. You know, these people, you know, they, they get saved maybe and they turn their lives around and they start dressing nice and going to church and giving their money and, you know, becoming a respectable member of the community. And they like, look at me, look at how good I am. And they get in that position where they're in good standing in their church community, all these things. And all of a sudden they think they are good. But listen, Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. You know, notice it says there's none. And that was from the Old Testament. You know, it didn't say there's none except for the saved. Okay, no, even the saved themselves in their flesh are not righteous. If you're righteous, it's only because of Jesus Christ. It's only because of what's living inside of you. It says that verse 12, they're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher and their, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is what we really look like. And listen, if you think you deserve heaven, you don't believe the Bible. If you think because you're sitting in church today, dressing nice, you got a King James Bible, I mean, everybody here thinks you're great. If you think that has anything to do with why you're going to heaven, you don't know your Bible. Right now, in your condition, you deserve to go to hell. But we're not. Why? Only because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And if you're trusting in your works at all, I talked to a Mormon just yesterday when we were in Phoenix at the, the soul winning marathon. And I'm, I'm asking this guy and he mentioned he was Mormon. I said, well, hey, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? He's like, well, it's, you know, it's of course salvation by faith in Jesus and, and works. And he flat out said and works. And he talked about a lot of other things you got to do. And I said, that's interesting. I said, because, you know, so I said, so you said works. So how many works do I have to do? I said, what, I said, what do you think the standard is? I said, how good do I have to be? And, you know, and he didn't really want to give me an answer. And I said, well, can I show you what we teach about salvation? And I showed him the verses that said, you know, it's not by works. Let's say man should boast. I said, you know, we're justified by faith without works. You know, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So I'm trying to show him, hey, you know, I'm showing them all these verses. It's not about works. And, and then, and so after I went through it, I said, I, I went through the whole plan of salvation. He's talking like he's agreeing with me, but I told him, I said, I said, Hey, and I said, when I talked to you before, you said, you think it's faith plus works. I said, you seem like you're agreeing with me right now. Have you changed your mind about that? Do you believe it's faith without works? And he's like, Oh yeah. He said, I, I believe it's faith in Christ without works, but there does need to be something. I, I think it's 99.999% faith. You know, and, you know, but I said, listen, I said, 
You're so close, but I said you have to get that point zero zero one out of there. I said you got to be relying completely on Christ. It's without works, period. And you know the Mormons, you know how they are. He he didn't get it. Unfortunately, he did not get saved, uh, and, and and that's sad. But you know what? I have heard Baptists say almost exactly the same things that he said. No, there will be some change. You know, you got to at least go to church. Why don't these Baptists just go join the Mormons? If they're going to teach that stuff, just join the stinking Mormons. All right, they're, you know, they're, you know, I don't know. It's just, it just, it ticks me off. I, I couldn't believe how much he sounded like some Baptists I know when I was talking to him. It made me sick. But listen, you, you, we can't deserve it. If you think you can make up for your sins, you don't understand the cross. If you think we are, you are acceptable to God, you clearly have not seen him. What does that mean to have seen him? Well, we see him by faith, don't we? You know, we believe what his word says about him. And if you believe his word, you're going to do like Isaiah did in Isaiah 6. And he said, woe is me, for I am undone. For mine eyes have seen the king. And Jesus talked about you have to see me to see the father. What does that mean? Does that mean Jesus is a father? No, he's saying you have to see me. You have to believe my words. Now, did everybody that looked physically on Jesus get saved? No, but everybody who saw him by faith, everyone who saw him for who he was and who he said he was, all who believed his words, they were the ones who saw him. And those today who think they are going to heaven because they have changed their life or something like that, they have not seen Jesus Christ. If you see Jesus Christ, you know what you're going to say? Lord, I can't save myself. Lord, just please give me that gift of salvation. That's what it means for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm telling you, these twitheads on Twitter, they, they have not seen Jesus Christ. If they're teaching that kind of thing, that is ridiculous. That's why I'm not on Twitter. I just can't handle all the stupidity on there. It just, it gets my goat. I'd be on there tweeting stuff and I'd be, you know, end up losing my testimony or something like that. That's the kind of foolishness that's on there. But, you know, and what's sad is that, you know, these guys, a lot of people follow them. And then they got Baptists attacking them about this stuff. And only one guy sticks up for them. And my wife, my wife too, she stuck up for them. Don't want to forget about her. My wife, she's got way more backbone than 90% of these Baptists on there. It just, it's like, you got to be, I, I got to rein her in all the time because she's always like ready to get in a fight on there and call out these false prophets on there. I got to like, you know, take it easy, all right? They're not going to take it well from a woman, okay? You know, people, you know, preachers don't like it when a woman makes them look like an idiot and makes them look like a spiritual dunce. And so, and she's, she's pretty good at that. But I, I do, I got I to gotta calm her down every once in a while, but... Uh, but yeah, that's, stuff like that ought to get us fired up. That's the problem with Christians today. Nothing gets them upset. You know, lies. I mean, heresy. It doesn't bother them one bit. But you know, turn over to Galatians five. So faith, it's a big deal because God chose faith because we are incapable of works. We can't do it. And God wanted us to be able to go to heaven, but we can't do works. God chose faith because it makes love possible. Turn over to Galatians chapter five. In verse 1, look what it says. Stand fast, therefore, from the liberty wherein Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If you have to do any of the law in order to be saved, Christ does nothing for you. If you add any work of the law and make it a part of salvation, Jesus Christ does nothing for you. That's what he's saying right there. Any of them. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. If you want to pick a law, any law, go right ahead. But the Bible says now you're required to do the whole law. Good luck with that. And just in case you're wondering your status on that, you've already blown it. And you're short of the glory of God. Even if you're good from here on out, you've still sinned. You're still going to go to hell. So I wouldn't try that. Verse 4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you because you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. You missed it. You missed it. You never got it. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now what's that talking about right there? A salvation without works is the only thing that makes it possible for us to obey God from the heart. 
It's the only thing. If I have to obey some laws in order to go to heaven, I'm going to be obeying laws out of fear. I'm going to be obeying laws because I have to. I'm going to be obeying laws not because I love God, but because I love myself and I don't want to go to hell. That's why I'm going to be obeying God. But a salvation without works that you can't lose. Okay, A salvation without works that you can't lose is what makes it possible to prove our love for Christ. Okay, well, you know, you're saved, and there's a lot of people that believe you lose your salvation. Most Baptists don't. But at the same time, many people do. They think you can lose it. Well, if I can lose it, now once again, I'm doing works not out of love, out of fear. I'm doing it out of love for myself because I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to burn for eternity. That's that what's going to be while I'm obeying God. But the fact that God said, I'm going to give you this gift, it costs you nothing. It is forever. You can't lose it. Now we're in a situation where I am free to love God or not love him. And I've used this illustration before. How would you like it you know, if you had to force your wife to stay with you? Or if she you know, gave you a list of, you know, checklist of items, if you, every day, that you, if, if there's any day you don't do one of these things, this marriage is over. And they might be good things she wants you to do, but now you're doing them because you're just scared of losing her. You know, you got to buy me flowers at least once a week. You know, and, and now it's not going to mean anything because you're buying flowers every week because I have to. Or this marriage is over. So it's not going to be special to her. It's not going to mean anything to her. And listen, our works, okay, are pathetic. All right, aren't they? You know, our works that we do for God are like that little two-year-old's drawing they bring to you. Okay, but we'll treasure those things, don't we? You know why? Because we know it was done out of love. That's why we appreciate a pathetic drawing where the kid can't even stay in the lines. Why did we appreciate that? Because it came with a heart of love. And when we, our works are not that great, they do not impress God, but when we do them by faith, we're doing them out of love. And if we were able to lose our salvation, the fact that we know we can't lose our salvation, but yet we still obey God anyway, that shows, you know what, we love him. We live in America today. My wife could divorce me just like that if she wanted to. She could take it probably more than half of everything I've got, and I'd probably have to pay her alimony. She could do that in this country. But you know what? She's not doing that. You know what that tells me? It tells me she wants to be with me. That tells me she wants to be my wife. I'm glad it's like that. I'm glad that I don't have to force her. I'm glad I don't have to lock her in her room at night you know, and put an ankle monitor on her. You know, that, that just wouldn't be a good marriage. And so God didn't do that with us. And faith, a salvation that's by grace through faith without works is the only thing that would make that possible. And we can have a relationship with God right now and we can love him. And how do we know that we love him? We love him if we keep his commandments. And people, the Baptists will take that. You know, if you love me, you keep my commandments. See, if you're not keeping his commandments, you're not saved. Is that what it says? No, it just says, if you love me, we well, are supposed to love God to be saved. Where's that verse? You know, where is that verse? It's actually a work to love God because isn't that the first and greatest commandment? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? You know, that's, that's a work too. We don't even have to do that because it's a salvation without works. Well, I don't like, you know, no, people should have to do something. Well, if we had to do something, then it would be impossible for us to just do it out of love. And that's what God wants. And faith is the only thing that would do that. If we were justified by works, then we would be able to serve God, or then we would not be able to serve God in the Spirit. Romans 4, 2 says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath where of the glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If we're working, God owes us salvation. That's not grace, that's debt. But to him that worketh not, but repenteth of their sins? Is that what it says? No, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. You all see that? Who does he justify? The ungodly. That person that's not going to church. That person doesn't dress like a Christian. That person that's smoking their cigarettes and drinking their beer and doing all those things we're not supposed to do. He justifies the ungodly. Where's the works there? Where's the repenting of your sins there? His faith is counted for righteousness. That is what the Bible says right there in black and white. And a free salvation that cannot be lost 
was the only way we could ever be capable of proving our love. And people do, they scoff at eternal security. They act like it's a license to sin, but God didn't give us eternal security so we would be free to sin, but so we would be free to love Him. And that's what it's all about. And you say, I I, I don't don't like that. Yeah, you know why? You know why these churches aren't soul winning anymore? You know why these churches aren't preaching the the truth about salvation anymore? Because it doesn't benefit the church to have somebody get saved and not repent of their sins and not come to church and not tithe and not make their church look good and not do all the things that they want to do. It doesn't benefit us in the flesh at all. But you know what? It sure does benefit them because they don't have to go to hell. It's what God has commanded us to do. And I wish everybody that got saved would repent of their sins and do all those things they're supposed to. But I'm sorry, God did not require that. And the Bible does not teach that. And we don't get to add that. And these people today, they're just selfish. It's all about them. It's not about pleasing God. You know what it is? It's about filling church pews and making the pastor look good. That's what it's all about. And so they're going to put these requirements on people that God didn't put on them. And listen... You might hear this and say, all right, why am I even coming to this church anymore? I'm on my way to heaven. Well, listen, if you're here thinking you need to do this to go to heaven, you're already not saved, so you're not doing our church any good, and we're not doing you any good. And the thing, I don't want people coming here for the wrong reasons, but you know what? I am teaching you this. And so you know what that tells me? If you guys show up tonight, if you show up Wednesday, you show up next Sunday, they're here because they love God. They're here out of obedience to Him. They're here because they want to be here. I I don't drag people to church. I I don't go begging people to come to church. I don't want a bunch of people here that don't want to be here. If you don't want to be here, do everyone a favor and leave. Don't get up all at once. You're just going to bring a bad spirit, and you're going to be doing it for all the wrong reasons. You're not even going to be pleasing God. You're going to bring your sorry spirit with you, and it's going to rub off on other people, and that's not what it's about. We're doing these things because we love God. That's the only reason I'm here today. I love God. I want to please Him. That's why I go soul winning. It doesn't always benefit me. I believe, you know, we, we've had benefits from soul winning. We've seen people saved. We've got people in our church here because of that. But you know what? A lot of people, you know, as far as I can count, I don't see where I'm greatly benefiting from it. You know, I went soul winning in Phoenix. How do I benefit from that? Okay? It's not about a physical benefit. It's about pleasing God. It's about just doing what He wants me to do. And so, it's not, it's not about us just proving to God we love Him, but it's, it proves it to ourselves too. 1 John 5, 1. This gets butchered by the Baptist too. But whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that... Right, that who, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're born of God. That's what it says. And everyone that loveth Him that begat him, loveth him also as begotten of him. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Keeping the commandments, it's what tells us that we love God, not that we're saved. He just said that he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So all I got to do is just you know believe in Jesus and then I can go do whatever I want. You know, and they'll ask those stupid questions like that. Listen, yeah, that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? That does kind of, yeah, that does kind of sound stupid. But wait a minute, it's what the Bible says. So, yeah, I'd like to think you'd have to do some works too, but that's not what God says. So guess what comes into play now? I'm going to have to choose who I'm going to believe. It's called, and then I'm going to have to have faith. And so, you know, what about that guy that never changes or just, you know, who cares about that guy? This is between you and God. Do you believe him? Are you just going to trust in his free gift and just accept that and not do the works? Or are you going to do what makes sense? Are you going to do what's popular and try to repent of your sins? And let me tell you, these people, when they stand before God on judgment day, it's going to be interesting when they're telling God about them repenting of their sins. You know what? They're not even going to try. After they see how holy God is, they're yeah, I, That was a waste of time even trying to repent of my sins. I didn't even come close. But finally, real quick, I'm not even going to all my scriptures on this. God chose faith, first of all, because we're incapable of works. God chose faith because faith is the only thing that makes makes love 
for God possible. But God chose faith so we would have a choice. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's another segment of Baptists that don't like that verse very much. We call them Calvinists. And they don't like that. But the uh, Bible says, whosoever believe that Jesus is... Or, um, wrong spot. Um, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 32. It mentioned how it was ch- they were children in whom is no faith. Some tr- and some try to make the claim that we have no choice in whether or not we get saved. Some say that faith is something God gives you. Okay, And that's what a lot... Of, I've had Calvinists tell me that before. But if that's the case, then why was God often rebuking people for not having faith? Didn't God rebuke Israel in Deuteronomy 32 for not having faith? He's getting all over them for not having faith. You know what Israel should have said? Well, Lord, He didn't give us any. No, He's rebuking them for it. Jesus constantly did that. Oh, ye of little faith. Why didn't you have any faith? Wherefore did ye doubt? Matthew 8, 26, and He said to them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? They should have said, Well, because you didn't give us any faith. You didn't choose before the foundation of the world that we would have faith. No, he got on them for not having faith because they should have faith. But they chose not to. It was their choice. Matthew 14, 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, if it's Jesus that gives him faith, he should have known. Well, I didn't give him any. People are teaching that today, that faith is something God gives you. No, faith is something all of us should have, but some of us choose not to have it. And there's more scriptures that can go on that. You know, the O ye of little faith. You know, Jesus, uh, after he appeared to the eleven, they sat at meat, Matthew 16, 14, and upbraided them with, uh, with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. He, Jesus is getting on to them. And, he's, and it says that the reason they didn't have any faith was because of their hardness of heart. They chose not to. It was their choice. And God cho- chose faith because it gives us a choice. And listen, I don't believe in arranged marriages. And I don't, I don't see how you have a good marriage when it's a arranged marriage. Can you imagine if your wife had to marry you? You know, imagine how, ladies, if you just, you know, somebody else picked your husband out for you. Like, here's the guy you're stuck with. Ah, you know, that'd be horrible. You know, I don't believe in arranged marriages. I think the guy and the girl ought to choose each other. You know, I think it's the guy that ought to initiate it. He should ask the girl... She wants to marry him, and she has a choice to say yes or forget it. You know, they, she ought to have that choice. And you know what? God gives us a choice. And I'm glad my wife had a choice when she married me. And faith, a faith-based salvation without works, is the only thing that made that, makes that possible. And it says in John 12, 32, verse 33, And if I be lifted from the earth, up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. He said, I'm going to draw all men unto me. But do all men get saved? No, some choose not to have faith. So listen, God's plan is clear. He wants to save, but He gives us a choice. He chose to make faith what we need for salvation because it's the one thing, it's the one thing that all of us are capable of. All of us can have faith. None of us can be good enough. None of us can make up for our sin. We can't be worthy in any way, so Jesus had to pay For all of our sin. And he had to do all the work. Okay? I believe Brother Dakota, I haven't got to listen to it yet. Wednesday, he preached on work salvation. He said he believes in work salvation, but it's the work of Jesus Christ. I say amen amen to that. I absolutely agree with that. He did all the work, so guess what? We can't boast. Nothing to boast about. It's excluded, the Bible says. Boasting, it is excluded. Salvation by grace through faith was the only it was the only way that we could get saved and have a choice. And so that, my friends, is why faith is such a big deal. And that's why we don't add anything to salvation. It doesn't matter if it makes sense. Yeah, repenting of your sins makes more sense, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The only way people can make that fit is to change the definition of repent. And I preach whole messages just defining repent from the Bible, letting the Bible define itself and not some theologian. And it's very clear what repent means. People just changed it. And so I hope that was a help to you today. So with that, let's all stand together.